Hello, welcome to Islamic Civilization. This time session 18 that deals with the, with the Caliphate of Ali radiallahu anhu. Uh, may God be pleased with him. That's what it means radiallahu anhu. And so he ruled from 656 to 661 AD, not a long rule, only five, ru five years, but those five years were full of problems. Make sure that uh, you pay attention to some of the problems that we are going to visit uh, during this session 18, during the Caliphate of Ali, because those problems are going to haunt the Muslim community and split the Muslim community into two groups, the Sunnis and the Shia. Just like Christians are divided into Catholics and Protestants, similarly, Muslims are divided into Sunni and Shia. Although the Sunni-Shia division took place over a political problem, a political question, but that political question later on became, you know, it found its other answers um, in terms of the sectarianism, the split in the community on the lines that could be talked about as religious division or sectarian division, even though the fundamentals of Islam are the same for both the Sunnis and the Shia, but there is still division over certain non-fundamental issues uh, in Islam. So that's why it's very important for you to note the differences between the Shia and the Sunni and what problems led to the schism or the division among the Muslims and made them Sunni and Shias, unfortunately. And those politics are still, you know, with us, uh, with the Muslim community in the 21st century, uh, in the sense that you see, you know, the division between the Sunnis and the Shia, especially in Iraq, which also became like, you know, the, uh, the, the, the soil or the place where all this problem between Sunni and Shia started. So let's see what we have in session 18 in the Caliphate of Ali. And so let's see in terms of objectives what we have in this session. Uh, Caliph, Caliphate of Ali, he sacked Caliph Osman's officials, the previous Caliph officials, and he fought in the first fitna or the civil war. And Ali fought against those who demanded of him to punish Caliph Usman's murderers. And eventually he was also killed by his own former extremist allies. So, you know, it, it was a very complex, very confusing situation when he came, uh, you know, and uh, took the caliphate. And he, you know, from one caliph that was murdered, and he himself was murdered by his former allies. So let's see what we have. The end of Usman's caliphate, we talked about this before, but it's good to remind you that the murder of Caliph Usman in 656, uh, he was murdered by extremist people. Uh, of course, they were Muslims and they went to the extreme and made the, the murder of Caliph Usman made this extremist group of people more powerful in Medina, which was the capital of Usman's caliphate. And so it created resentment in Osman's family, his clan, and his, uh, you know, friends. And so some of them found Medina uh, unsafe for them. So they left Medina for Syria, where their clansman, Muawiyah the first, was the governor. Muawiyah the first himself he belonged to the family of uh, Usman, the, the clan of Usman, and Usman had appointed him the governor of Syria. So Usman's uh, clansmen, they went to him 
to seek his protection and further, you know, it would complicate the politics of the region. So Muslims became divided between pro-Usman, pro-Ali, neutral people and extremist people. And that division, you know, created big confusion in the community of Muslims at that time. Honestly, people did not know who was who. And so the vast majority of the people, the good people, Muslims, uh, they were very, you know, uh, at pain to see the situation like, a, you know, a caliph was recently murdered and then there were these murderers, the extremists, uh, milling around in the streets of Medina, making, you know, the place very unsafe for a lot of people. And that would eventually, uh, you know, force the caliph Ali to move his capital from Medina to Kufa in Iraq. And so that tells you a lot, you know, why people left Medina because it was, you know, this was the city of the prophet, but now it was in the hands of very extremist people. So let's see what else we have. The end of Osman Caliphate. Both the peaceful majority and the extremist minority, they approached Ali, uh, separately though, they approached Ali, the son-in-law of Muhammad, to become the next caliph, and that would be the fourth caliph in Islamic history. First, Ali declined the caliphate offer because he knew it was not a good thing to have, but then later he found himself forced by good, well, you know, well-meaning people, and so he found himself forced into it and accepted the office of caliphate. So he had to become the caliph. Now, this type of a uh, coming into caliph, he really, uh, the, 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 I mean, the, the historians are divided, but the vast majority of people believe that it would have been better for him to have this caliphate in peaceful time, but that was none, none of his choosing. Uh, so he came to caliphate in very bad timing, full of chaos, confusion, you know, a caliph had just been murdered and he knew there were, you know, bad people in the city. And so he said, okay, if, you know, the good people wanted him to become the caliph, maybe they might help the situation and pull, you know, uh, the vast majority of the people, Muslims, out of this problem and calm down the situation. But then he was surrounded by a lot of, you know, extremist people that would ruin, ruin his policies. So let's see what happened. So that's his full name, Ali Ibn Abi Talib, Ali the son of the, uh, Abi Talib. And he was, as I told you, the son-in-law of Prophet Muhammad wasallam. peace be upon him. He was married to Fatima, the daughter of the Prophet. And they had two sons, Hassan and Hussein. He was a renowned soldier in the battlefield, but also celebrated as a scholar in Islamic law. And what made him, you know, unique, his emphasis on independent thinking. And that was, you know, a rare type of, uh, I mean, uh, thinking for that time. So that independent thinking made him very famous, uh, not just only at that time, but also even the, you know, present times in Islamic law, uh, he believed that people should go to the Quran and Hadith. But as time moves on, People change, place change, and the, you know, the period changes upon people. So they would come across and would face new problems that were not mentioned at that time in the Quran and Hadith. So they should be thinking independently and solve, you know, the, uh, find the solution for their problem. And that is called ijtihad, the renewal of the Islamic law, so to speak. And so that would be very strong among his people that would follow uh, Caliph Ali. Let's see what else. Ali ibn Abi Talib, the new Caliph. So he ruled for five years and that, that, you know, those five years were full of problems. So tumultuous rule that eventually led to his murder by extremists. Stagnation of Islamic empire because he was so busy inside you know, with the ext internal problem that he could not 
attend to the external problems that would be the, you know, the, the future of the next caliph or the next ruler. So he did not f fight external wars uh, against Persia or against the Byzantine Empire. So the Caliphate of Ali, in 656 he was declared the fourth caliph of the Muslims inside Arabia and in the new Islamic empire. So, and that new Islamic empire consisted of Egypt, Syria, Iraq, Persia or Iran, and modern day country of Afghanistan. So that tells you, you know, how, I mean, vast that empire for those days it was. The new caliph faced opposition, especially from Aisha, first and foremost, the wife of Prophet Muhammad وسلم, and that was not, you know, a small thing, a big opposition. And then Muawiyah, the clansman of, uh, and the relative of, uh, so to speak, of the previous uh, caliph, and he was the governor of Syria. So these two strong people opposed him and that would ruin everything for him. Staying with the Caliphate of Ali, Usman's clansmen demanded revenge. They demanded of Caliph Ali to punish the murderers of Caliph Usman. Ali could not punish the murderers because there were too many people who were involved in the murder of Caliph Usman and they were not only from the uh, you know, Arabian Peninsula, some of them came from outside, from Egypt. And so some of the murderers in fact had joined Ali's camp. Ali's army and that also made it very difficult for him to go against those people and so he believed that okay he was murdered, the previous caliph was murdered and so hopefully if uh, things and times cool down, later on he could do something about those people but he believed that they were very strong and people were confused, some of the people were worried for their own safety and so some had already left Medina to one place or another place, some went to Mecca, some even out of completely, out of uh, you know, the Arabian Peninsula and went to uh, Syria. So that's why he needed time and he could not move right away against the murders or the assassins of Caliph Usman. Okay. He refused to take action against the murders of Caliph Usman, you know, and for some good reasons. But also he started sacking governors and high officials who had been appointed by Caliph Usman. That created a lot of resentment. And so he appointed his own trusted officials and that's what Caliph Usman had done. He appointed his own trusted officials but now uh, Caliph Ali removed them and replaced them with his own trusted officials. Definitely it was going to uh, backfire and create resentment among the family and people of Usman. Now the Prophet's widow Aisha who at that time was 44 years old, she moved from Medina to Basra in Iraq for one good reason, she needed safety, protection so she went there. Also in Basra and Iraq there were people who were pro uh, Usman and anti-Ali so she joined them. She joined the anti-Ali forces in Basra in Iraq. Muawiyah, governor of Syria, he had been, as I said, appointed by Caliph Usman. He also turned against Caliph Ali because he wanted Caliph Ali to uh, go after those people who had murdered uh, Usman. So these two very powerful personalities, one, you know, the wife, the widow of the Prophet and the second person Muawiyah who had been appointed by Usman the previous Caliph, also a very powerful person, he had a huge big clan and you know he had the control of Syria and so with that control of Syria came a lot of economic resources, a lot of human resources, he had his own army. So he felt like he was already the king or the Caliph of Syria so that's why he wanted his own independence and he would not even recognize Ali as the caliph. So he would not obey 
Caliph Ali. So, that would make things very difficult for Caliph Ali. Let us see further. So, several leading Muslims did not like uh, Caliph Ali's policies of confrontation, especially with Usman's family. They advised Ali not to sack officials who had been appointed by Caliph Usman because that created resentment. But Ali's extremist allies demanded exactly that, to take action against Usman's clansmen. So that meant war. And so these extremist people wanted war against him. So that would lead us to the first fitna or tumult or the civil war uh, that you know went from 656 to 661 from day one that Caliph Osman came to power as Caliph and then the day that he was himself assassinated. So these five years of his rule as a Caliph were full of problems and so those problems are lumped together in what is called fitna or tumult, uh, warfare or civil war. So these tumultuous, you know, times for Caliph Ali uh, made life, uh, you know, miserable at that time. And so that's why uh, the, the fitna, uh, especially the first fitna, the war between him and Aisha on, on the one side and him and then uh, Caliph, uh, I mean, uh, the governor of Syria uh, on the other hand. So fighting these two wars and then he had to fight also against the extremists who were his allies and those extremists would eventually kill him. So let's see uh, what else we have. Here better of the camel and I will tell you how this name came about. Caliph Ali mobilized forces from Medina. Aisha had already reached Basra so she in his view she was making trouble for him. And so that's how he had to mobilize forces. The two forces fought for 110 days in Iraq. Okay. Ten, close to 10,000 Muslim soldiers were killed from both sides. And that was a huge big loss for Muslims at that time. When they needed to be together here, they are killing, you know, they were killing each other. Aisha was captured and she was sent with respect to Medina and there she, you know, lived and eventually died. Now this battle became known as the Battle of the Camel. Uh, Aisha was riding on the camel when she was fighting. And so uh, Ali came with this uh, sort of a strategy that as long as she was on the camel, people would not give up fighting, her people, they would fight to death. And so he asked one of his soldiers to go and uh, I mean hit the feet of the camel. So the moment the camel went down, she also went down. And so those people, you know, who could not see her uh, anymore on the top of camel and the camel was down, they believed that she was killed. So there was no use to fight, you know, any further. So they left the battlefield and went their own way. And that is how this uh, whole battle is called the uh, battle of the camel, camel in Arabic is called Jamal. So this uh, Battle of Jamal and Battle of Camel, that's how it was named because of the camel whose feet was, you know, cut by the soldier and she and the camel both went down and so that finished the war and the trick worked. Okay, let's see. So Aisha was captured and she was sent back to Medina. Ali made Kufa, Iraq his new capital because he could not go back to Medina. Uh, he believed that there were a lot of troublemakers in Medina and that was, you know, uh, a beautiful city of the Prophet, but he needed to uh, move to another country and his capital and that was Kufa in Iraq. Very big move. The next battle of Safin in Syria in 657 that he had to fight. So Caliph Ali ordered Muawiyah, the governor of Syria, who had been, as I told you, appointed by uh, uh, Usman the third caliph. So Ali ordered Muawiyah to pledge allegiance, obedience or surrender. Muawiyah, the governor of Syria, he had been appointed by Caliph Usman and of course he would not surrender. He demanded rather Ali punish Usman's murders, which Ali would not do or could not do. 
So that is how the three day battle of Safin started between the two of them. And so, but those people got killed, you know, in that battle also, not too many, but still it was a, you know, three day, three day battle, but it turned out to be inconclusive. Nobody knew. And the reason why it became inconclusive because uh, Caliph Ali, uh, here you have uh, a, uh, an image uh, made around 16th century uh, by, uh, I believe this is also an image made by a Shia person, uh, artist. Okay. Staying with the Battle of Safin, uh, on the fourth day, Muawiyah asked for arbitration. And Ali was forced and he agreed to negotiate. And he knew this was a trick, but he had to go uh, with negotiations he could not refuse because his uh, own followers told him, you have to negotiate. So both forces were completely withdrawn. That was the first condition. Each one had to go, you know, back to their camps. So no more fighting. Everybody, you know, soldiers were withdrawn. And then negotiations, negotiations started for a, like, like a month long. And that arbitration, you know, was strict in favor of Muawiyah. And Ali knew that all along that that was Muawiyah's trick. So he was strict into negotiations and arbitration. And then the two persons, uh, each one had appointed an arbitrator. And those two persons, you know, somehow something went uh, wrong between the two of them. And one of them decided, uh, gave the decision in favor of Muawiyah. And Ali's person, arbitrator, he kept quiet. He didn't say anything. So people believe that, uh, you know, the decision went in favor of Muawiyah and that forced Ali to stop fighting, number one. Also forced Ali not to ask the governor of Syria, Muawiyah, to uh, quit his position, come to him, and be loyal to him and pledge the allegiance. So it made things very difficult for uh, Caliph Ali, but still uh, he believed that he was the right Caliph. Let's see what else. So arbitration, as I said, was strict in favor of Muawiyah. Ali submitted to forced arbitration. He stopped the fighting, but still he remained the Caliph. He returned to his capital Kufa in Iraq rather than to Medina, and so he is still the Caliph. Caliph Ali forces were divided, and it was more because of the negotiation, negotiation than of the fighting. They wanted him to leave Muawiyah alone to rule Syria. You stay as Caliph and he will stay the governor of Syria. Uh, there was another group who demanded Afali to fight against Muawiyah, and these were the extremist people. Extremists, these people are called Kharijis or Kharijites because they left Caliph Ali, so the Kharij means leaving, and just because they left Caliph Ali, that is how they became known as Kharijis, those who left Ali. So Kharij means to leave, and that's Arabic, uh, Kharij, English translation, to leave. So because they left Caliph Ali, the, the reason was simple, he did not want to fight against Muawiyah. Ali did not want to fight against Muawiyah because of the arbitration, even though it was strict. But still, they insisted that he must fight them. First, they wanted him to agree to arbitration. When he agreed, then he wanted him, you know, to fight also. And so that was, he was not going to do that. So they adopted violent political and religious ideology, especially against uh, their, you know, leader, Caliph Ali. Uh, these former allies of Ali turned against him. And they condemned him, uh, they condemned Caliph Ali and prepared to fight him. That was their, you know, going, the, the, I mean, the, the, the troublemakers, they became more focused on Caliph Ali to kill him rather than do anything else. Then the next is the Battle of Nahrawan, uh, outside Baghdad. These Kharijis, those who seceded or left, they believed, and they adopted, you know, strange uh, ideologies, that caliphate belonged to any true Muslim. 
and most probably they believed that they were the true Muslim and everybody else was, you know, infidel. They condemned Ali for not standing for truth, which was fight against uh, Muawiyah. Caliph Ali exterminated most of them in this battle of Nahrawan. He attacked them uh, near, uh, you know, Nahrawan is a town near Baghdad. However, he did not exterminate uh, all of them. So some of them, three, two, three persons, they came, uh, you know, to Kufa and there they assassinated him. So they were extremist people and these extremist people, you know, they did not believe in any, any peace. They believe in their own holiness. They believe that they were the true Muslims. And, you know, Ali, they even, they believe that, uh, you know, uh, he was, a, I mean, they would call other Muslim infidels, you know, uh, simply as that. And so they did not believe in him. And they thought that he did not stand for truth, which was, his right to be the caliph. So they were forcing this caliphate upon him from day one, you know, and he did not like that. So he went to war with them, he killed them, but somehow when he defeated them, he came back. You know, he thought that was the end of it, but that wasn't. Uh, and so two guys, they came and killed him. Okay, let's see what else. So the burial site of Caliph Ali. Ali, when he was killed, uh, when he was, uh, you know, injured and because of that, the, the wounds, he died. So before his death, he said that he should be buried in a secret place so that these Kharijis, these extremists, would not come and find his grave because they, he believed that they would desecrate his grave and maybe even take his body. So that's why he was buried in a secret place. Now, later on, around, uh, you know, maybe three, four hundred years later, somebody said that this, in Najaf, they found a grave, and they thought that grave was the grave of Ali. However, close to those times and later, somebody believed that uh, his body had been taken as far away from Iraq as east and northeast as Afghanistan, which is the north of Afghanistan. And so his people had buried him there in a place called Mazari Sharif. And so that is why, uh, you know, people are, uh, I mean, not confused, but they, they, they just still worry. Is he in Najaf in Iraq, his dead body? Or is he in, uh, in Afghanistan, uh, up north? And so in Mazari Sharif, in a place town called Mazari Sharif. And so uh, people don't know. And there, there are people who believe that maybe he may not be even in either place. However, most, the vast majority of both Shia and Sunnis believe that he was buried in Najaf. And so that's the reason. Uh, although, uh, if we can go back to the uh, previous clip, uh, there, uh, the one on the right, uh, that is, uh, I would love to, you know, believe that that is the real place because that is close to my hometown you know, in Afghanistan, rather than, you know, going all the way to Najaf uh, in Iraq, which is far away. So personally, I would love to, you know, have him buried in Afghanistan rather than in Iraq, but that's, uh, I don't know, you know, where he is. But the vast majority of Muslims, both Shia and Sunni, believe that he is buried in Najaf. He was buried in Najaf in Iraq, uh, in, and so later on, his grave was revealed to people. Okay, so this one, his burial site in Najaf, that is the most agreed upon uh, place. And so I also tend to believe that he is possible, but there is no DNA proof of it, okay? Let's see what else. So the first fitna, the tumult, the civil war continued even after the death or the killing or assassination of uh, Caliph Ali. The fitna continues. Ali's sons now would fight against Muawiyah's son. Okay. Hassan and Hussein, these were Ali's two sons. And so they would fight Yazid, the son of Muawiyah, and their rival clans, Abbasid on you know, Ali's side or Ali's son's side, and the Umayyads on the side of Yazid, they would fight and continue the problem 
for quite some time. So Hassan was, uh, you know, he was proclaimed a caliph. Uh, Muawiya told him, you abdicate, which he did, and went back to Medina to live a peaceful life. But anyway, uh, the historian tells us that on Muawiya's uh, instigation, he was poisoned to death in 669 AD. His other brother, Hussein, he uh, picked the fight uh, against uh, uh, Muawiyah's son, Yazid, and uh, this Hussein was also killed, along with his family in the famous Battle of Karbala in Iraq in 680 AD. So this Battle of Karbala, that is a very famous battle coming out of the Fitna. And the most celebrated battle, the most talked about, the most written about, and the more it has been written and talked about, the more, you know, people still uh, feel confused about it, that who was right and who was wrong. So there are people, you know, on both sides. However, the vast majority of Muslims, both Shia and Sunni, they believe that the battle of Karbala should not have happened to begin with. Yazid could stay in Syria as the ruler of Syria, and Hassan could stay in Iraq as the caliph of the Muslim people, uh, mostly Sunnis uh, and Shias, uh, in Iraq at that time. So the vast majority of Muslim definitely would go with Hassan uh, and Hussein, the two sons of Ali, and because they, you know, have the sympathies of the vast majority of the people, they were wronged, they were mistreated, and they were brutally killed. And so that's why the vast majority of people believe that they had the right to caliphate, not the other party, not the party of the Umayyad or the son of uh, Muawiyah Yazid. So vast majority of Muslim would go with the two sons of Ali. Whether Shia or Sunni, they would go with the two sons of Ali against Muawiyah and Yazid. There are communities uh, among Muslim, they would never, uh, they would never name their sons as Yazid, because the word Yazid and the name Yazid stands for a very cruel person, and that cruelty was because you know he massacred the family uh, of. Uh, Hussein in the Battle of Karbala. So Yazid is not really a good term anymore, uh, even though it could be, you know, taken as a name among the Arabs, but among the non-Arabs like, uh, you know, uh, Muslims in Turkey, India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, or uh, Iran, and Afghanistan, no person would name his son as Yazid. Okay, let's see what else. The Battle of Karbala very much talked about and it has been, you know, a lot of stuff has been written about it in every detail. Some, I mean, fictional also, and that's what happens. And it also became, you know, uh, the stuff of the art, especially on part of the Shia community, Shia Muslims. So here, the Sunni Shia sectarian differences among Muslim that we need to talk about because Till this day, you know, uh, it creates problems for the Muslims. The Sunni Shia sectarian differences, regionalism and sectarianism, they went hand in hand in early Islam because Arab or Islamic expansion brought into Islam different ethnic and linguistic groups. Not all of them had same understanding of Islam based on the Quran and Hadith. Sunnis versus Shia sectarian differences come exactly out of that period and mostly based on, in fact, ignorance. What happened in history, the history books, the authors, they are also partisans in the division between Shia and Sunnis. And so it depends whom you listen to and whom you believe in. That is the reason the problem between the Shia and the Sunnis, the historical and the hatred, you know, what happened in history still continues. Uh, it is also mixed up with politics, with re regionalism, also with linguistic problems, differences between the people. That's how it becomes very complicated. Uh, I should tell you uh, something. 
uh, before we go into these differences. Remember, this whole problem between the Shia and the Sunni, it started over the question of politics. Then it went into, you know, groups and gangs, and so it took more like a religious color, and as I told you, religiously speaking, the two of them, both Sunni and Shia, believe in the same Quran and in the same fundamentals of Islam. There would be definitely some variation, but that variation does not make any one of them non-Muslim because both believe in the same Quran. And that's the reason the fundamentals are the same, but then there are some other issues between the two of them and some, you know, extremists on both sides, the Sunni and the Shia. They would rather, you know, magnify the differences than the common, you know, ground between the two of them, which is the holy book of Islam, the Quran, and Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, peace be upon him. Let's see. So the sectarian differences, the vast majority of Sunni, they believed in the legitimacy of the first four caliphs, Abu Bakr, Umar, Usman, and Ali. However, the minority of Muslims, especially the clannish partisans of Ali, and partisans mean Shia in Arabic, uh, Shia, uh, Arabic, and so in English it means partisan. The partisan or the Shia of Ali, they believed uh, Ali should have been the first Imam or the first Caliph, so to speak. So on the Sunni side, the leader is called Caliph, and the Shia side, the leader is called Imam. Sunnis take hadith, that is the sayings of Prophet Muhammad وسلم, uh, from almost all companions of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. Shias, however, accept hadith from Muhammad's family members called Ahlul Bayt. So only the Ahlul, ba Ahlul Bayt and their descendants would be eligible to give the hadith report what the Prophet said. Shia greatly venerate Ahlul Bayt, the family of the Prophet, but they do not worship them. So, you know, everybody should know they do not worship Ahlul Bayt. However, they do venerate, give high respect to the family of the Prophet. And it becomes, you know, also the stuff of uh, their art. Sunnis religious political leaders are, or caliphs could be any good Muslim. However, on the Shia side, they accept such leaders or imams who belong to Muhammad's family, sallallahu alayhi wa Like Ali, his wife Fatima, and their two sons, Hussein and Hassan, and their descendants, they could become the leaders, religious and political leaders of the Muslims on the Shia side. But the Sunni believe that any good Muslim could become the leader or the caliph uh, for the Muslims. So there is the, the difference between the two of them. Sunnis do not like drawing images of the Prophet وسلم, or his family or his friends. Shia do not mind drawing such images. Pilgrimages to Ahlul Bayt shrines very common among Shia. Passion plays and sectarian art depicting life events of the Ahlul Bayt, that is very common among Shia. So if you see in uh, history books or art books, uh, the Islamic art, if you see, see images of the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, or that of Ali or any other member of the Prophet, uh, that would be most probably made that image made by a Shia artist person. And they made those images much more giving respect and veneration to the person that they were depicting in the image, like the Prophet or the personality of Ali or the image of Ali. However, the Sunnis were not like that. For a simple reason, number one, nobody knows really how the Prophet looked like. This would be the same case on part of the Christians that really nobody knows how he looked like. And so that is why uh, Christ is, his image is made more in the image of the person, of his culture and race, if you look at, you know, 
the European images of Christ, he looks like a European person. And definitely he did not look, you know, a blonde, blue eyes European person. Similarly, if a Chinese, you know, draws the image of Jesus, he looked like a Chinese. And of course, he was not Chinese. And especially if you look at the Ethiopian Christian uh, images of Christ, he looks like any Ethiopian uh, black person. Of course, he was not like that. And so that's why nobody knows how Jesus looked like, peace be upon him. Similarly, nobody among the Muslim, you know, there are descriptions, you know, of his uh, features, how he looked like, but nobody had really tried, you know, to make his image when he was alive. No, nobody could dare even to make sculpture, which is completely prohibited, or statue of Muhammad. No way, nobody could do that. And so that is why uh, Muslims, uh, I mean, on the Sunni part, uh, Sunni Muslim would not like to draw images of the Prophet or his, uh, you know, family members or his friends. But on the Shia side, you do see those images made by the Shia artist. As I said, much more in terms of veneration, respecting the person like uh, even Ali, uh, uh, may God be pleased with him, radiallahu anhu. His image is very common, you know, made in, among the, uh, the Shia community, but not so on the Sunni side. Okay, let's see further. Reverence for Ahlul Bayt in Shia art. Muhammad and Ali, they are always juxtaposed. And so here in this image, of course, made by a Shia artist, Muhammad receives Ali and Ali is accompanied by Gabriel. So a lot could be made of this uh, image, you know, but still uh, the Sunnis don't like that image. And so, and the Shia, you know, they, they do that because they show respect to Ali accompanied by, you know, Gabriel, angel Gabriel, and coming to the Prophet and the Prophet receives him. That shows his status, Ali's status in the sight of uh, the Prophet Muhammad. And so they're both, they're shown very close to each other, very much liked by each other. and. Uh, so that elevates the, the status of Ali uh, in the Shia community. Here also in this image, Ali mirrors Prophet Muhammad wasallam, peace be upon him. And so on the right, in Arabic, it is written Muhammad, peace be upon him. On the left is written Ali. And so they are made of the same letters and although the letters are very different, uh, in the name of Muhammad, you see uh, like um, uh, the letters corresponding to English, uh, Meme, H, and D, which is very different from Ali's name, English transliteration, A, L, I. And so they are made, the, the name of Ali has been written in such a way that it looks like Muhammad and Muhammad looks like, you know, the name looks like Ali. So this juxtaposition of the two names and mirroring each other means a lot. And so Sunnis, they keep, you know, uh, things quite separate. But here you see the mixing of the two, so to speak, on part of the Shia artist. Ali is always called the friend of Allah. And so, uh, which uh, the Sunnis don't mind, they, they can call him also uh, Wali. And so here this uh, beautiful calligraphy says, Ali Waliullah, Ali is the friend of Allah. Uh, boy, this calligraphy is very beautiful. Let's see further. Ali, the vicegerent of Allah. And here you see in this beautiful calligraphy, La Fatta Illa Ali, La Saifa Illa Zulfiqar, Arabic. English, no victor except Ali, and no sword except that of Ali. When the, the, the sword of Ali is also known as, has a name called Zulfiqar, and it is the two-pointed sword, famous sword of Ali. Ali, the line of Allah, right there. Well, behind the, the horse, there is a not too visible line in this, uh, you know, beautiful piece of art, and of course, again, you know, made by 
a Shia artist. And this is to show great respect uh, to Ali, not to, I mean, you know, annoy any other person, the Sunnis or anybody else. So it is, uh, you know, uh, I mean, the product of the love of the artist for Ali. And so sometimes what happens among the orthodox uh, Sunni communities that that love goes beyond love. And so it verges on the border of worship, but as I told you, uh, the Shias do not worship, you know, Muhammad or Ali or anybody else. They worship just like the Sunnis only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, God only. And so, but still, you know, some Sunnis do not like this extreme veneration of the Ahlul Bayt, the family members of the Prophet Muhammad. Whether they like it or not, the Shia, you know, uh, are going to do it anyway. So here you see that respect for the uh, uh, members of uh, Muhammad, especially that of Ali uh, in this uh, piece of art. Let's see further. Ali, the line of Allah, and here is the sword, the two-pointed sword of Ali, and that's also, you know, uh, beautiful Arabic, and that Arabic, the twist and turns could easily uh, be, um, you know, made into a line. And so that line is the result of the twist and turns of beautiful calligraphy. Also, the five pure, very famous and very repeated image among the Shia. And so it says, Muhammad, peace be upon him, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Ali, Fatima, Hassan, and Hussein, radiallahu anhum ajma'een. May God be pleased with all of them. So in this image also at the top, uh, you see Fatima, the daughter of uh, the Prophet, and her husband down, Ali, and then Muhammad uh, further down, and then Hassan on the right and Hussein on the left, the two sons of Fatima and Ali, and the, t the only two grandchildren of Muhammad, peace be upon him. The five peer right there also, uh, on the right, uh, right above, uh, right Muhammad, on the left Ali, down you have Fatima, Hussein, and Hassan. And uh, in the middle it says Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim, in the name of God who is most merciful, most kind. And so this is a very historic, you know, uh, uh, art uh, among the Shia. Uh, some survived, some did not, and it till, uh, till this day it continues. Uh, the same, you know, five, uh, uh, as uh, in Persian is called Panjtan Park, the five pure personalities, so to speak. Uh, Ali himself, I mean, first uh, Muhammad, the prophet, then his daughter, Fatima, and her husband Ali, and their two children, Hassan and Hussein. So these five uh, you know, are repeated in the Shia art. And some of it is very beautiful, although because of the copyright, I could not show you all of them. But uh, it becomes, you know, a sort of a, uh, the artist, especially among the Shia, when they show their love, their respect uh, for the family of the Prophet Wasallam, then they, they put a lot of time and energy and beauty in that art. And so that's how, what few pieces you saw. Let's see further. Pilgrimage to Imam Hussein Mosque, very common thing among the Shia. And so there you have uh, the mosque of uh, Imam Hussein, the second son of Ali. He was killed at the Battle of Karbala at the hands of Yazid, the son of Muawiyah. And as I said, you know, nobody would like to name their son Yazid among the non-Arab Muslims. So it's a very, uh, you know, famous uh, site for the pilgrimage among the Shia. The Sunnis also go there, uh, no question about it, but not in big numbers, not in big number as the Shia do, okay. al Askari Mosque before and after the bombing, and this shows you the hatred among the extremists on the two, I mean, sides. So on the left, you see the mosque, uh, which is called Al Askari Mosque, that is the mosque where the 10th and 11th 
uh, imams, the 10th and 11 imams are buried in uh, that mosque. On the left, you do not see it because it was blown up in 2006 twice, once in 2006 and then in 2007. It was blown up by the extremist on the Sunni side. Most probably it was blown up by Al Qaeda during the second Gulf War between Saddam Hussein and George Bush. So it was blown up and most people agree that uh, they did not just simply want to blow up this mask. They wanted to create more sectarian hate and violence among the Shia and the Sunnis of Iraq. Uh, as you might know, uh, Shia in Iraq, they are about 60 percent of the population. The Sunnis are the 40 percent population, but Sunnis are divided among Kurdish Sunnis and Arab Sunnis. So the Arab Sunnis, 20 percent of the population, they had been in the personality of Saddam, so to speak, the Sunni had been ruling uh, Iraq. And so when Saddam Hussein was deposed and hanged, of course, the power went to the Shia community and now they share it both with the Sunnis as well, as well as with the Kurdish people. And so hopefully peace would be restored to that country. Um, every now and then, you know, you hear suicide bombing and other bombing, car bombing going on in Iraq. But this uh, unfortunate, you know, casualty, the Askari mask, a very old medieval, from the medieval times, very old mask and it was very important for the Shia community because their 10th and 11th, two Imams are buried there and, you know, but still it was amazing that the Shia leaders at that time, they knew the trick and so they did not, you know, fall for the trick. They told people do not massacre the Sunnis as a revenge and that's what the Al-Qaeda people wanted and so everybody agrees on that and so uh, it did not, uh, you know, create any massacre between the two community, even if, you know, that beautiful mosque uh, was blown up into pieces. Let's see further. Hassan and Hussein, uh, this was a TV film made, uh, you know, in Iraq for Iraqi TV and some Sunnis did not like it. And so they went to the parliament and the Iraqi parliament banned, it, banned that uh, film in August, uh, you know, 2011, not too long ago. So it was banned. Some Shia did not like it, but the vast majority of the Shia leaders, they believe that uh, uh, it was a good thing to ban it because they do not want any more further problems between the Shia and Sunni uh, community in Iraq, and they need peace, you know, bo on both sides. So when the Sunnis objected to that uh, TV show, they approached, their leaders approached the parliament and uh, it is, you know, Shia majority parliament. And so the Shia leaders inside the parliament agreed that it was not a good movie or TV series, so they banned it. And so that's how, you know, till this day, the problem exists between the Shia and Sunni, especially in Iraq. Uh, also in the region, you should know that uh, the Shia population uh, in Iran, uh, that is predominantly Shia population. More than 90% or 95% population of Iran is Shia. 60% population in Iraq is Shia. So these are the two Shia majority countries in the Middle East, Iran and Iraq. There are also Shia minorities almost everywhere in the Middle East especially in Saudi Arabia, in the northeastern part of Saudi Arabia, and also in Bahrain, which is, uh, you know, Shia majority country. But anyway, the Sunni uh, are the rulers uh, in that country in Bahrain. There are also Shia in Kuwait and other Gulf countries. So the Shia believe that they should be given the, you know, their right uh, political power, so to speak, or their political place in the country. Uh, because in some countries they are majority, but the Sunni minority are ruling them. Conversely, in Syria, the majority is Sunni, but the Shia minority are ruling them. 
And you see the problem already there in Syria has started. And according to Kofi Annan, the uh, previous, the former uh, Secretary General of United Nations, he tried his best to create peace between the Assad family or the Assad regime, so to speak, which is a Shia uh, Alevi group of people and the Sunni majority, but that uh, peace, I don't think it would work because there are too many uh, people involved in it. And so that's the reason you see the Shia Sunni problem still ruining people's lives inside the Middle East. Also, it worked you know, very badly in Afghanistan. Most of the Taliban, almost all of the Taliban were Sunni, and so they did not, did not like the Shia. And one particular community, the Hazara, in Afghanistan, they are almost all of them are Shia. And so I remember, you know, uh, one time the Taliban, they massacred some of the Shia Hazara people inside Afghanistan. Similarly, on the Pakistani side, especially closer to my hometown in Peshawar, uh, we have a Shia Sunni problem, is, and particularly among the tribes in places like Parachinar, and so there too you have Shia Sunni problem, and that complicates the situation between uh, Taliban and Al-Qaeda, who are predominantly Sunni on the one hand, and the rest of the governments in Pakistan or in Afghanistan or even you know, the, the uh, operations uh, of the NATO and United, Nation, United States in Afghanistan. So it becomes very complicated business in that part of the world because of the sectarian problems of Shia and Sunni uh, in Afghanistan and Pakistan and Iraq and Iran also, to some extent in Iran. Let's see further. Well, further, sectarian map of Iraq right there. The south is predominantly Shia. The uh, central west is predominantly Sunni. The northeast, the yellow stuff, that is Kurdish. And that is how, you know, Iraq is divided uh, till this day, and that division creates problems. Okay. Reaction report is coming at you. So write brief notes on the causes of the first civil war among Muslims and write the, you know, brief notes on the sectarian differences between Sunni and Shia Muslims. I think you can do that easily. And we talked a lot about that. And so let's see in review what we did. We talked about Caliphate of Ali. Caliph Ali turned against pro-Usman clan, fought in the first uh, fitna or civil war, and killed eventually by his own former extremist allies. And then we talked about the Sunni Shia sectarian differences and how, you know, Shia sectarian art was created out of, you know, some of the beliefs of the Shia population in the region. So stay engaged. Any question, any comments, please let me know via Laulima. Check your assignments. Anything you need to know, just send me a message. And thank you very much. This is the end of session 18 to continue next with 19. All the best. Aloha. Thank <laughs> you.